Hello and welcome. This video is an introduction to the Wilmette Institute course on Sufism and it is entitled Islamic Mystic Quests for the Ultimate Beloved. This video will be focused on together trying to define what is Sufism. So as a first step it is a good idea to write down your own definition of Sufism either on a piece of paper or type it out. I recommend pausing the video at this point and articulating what definition you have for Sufism as a first step to upload your background knowledge on the subject as an opening to for further learning and synthesis of further knowledge. As your definition of Sufism quite likely had something to do with mysticism, I do recommend then also writing down a definition of mysticism, either typed or on a piece of paper. So first, as a matter of introduction, we can make note that Sufis call themselves the people, or in their Arabic, el qawm. Sometimes they call themselves the companions, companions of the Prophet or the companions of God, ashab, and sometimes the poor. And this is the word faqir. And this designation of themselves as the poor reminds me of Baha'u'llah's hidden words, where he says, Be not troubled in poverty, nor confident in riches, for poverty is followed by riches, and riches is followed by poverty. Yet to be poor in all save God is a wondrous gift, but little not the value, of the value thereof, for in the end it shall make thee rich in God. And thus thou shalt know the meaning of the words, In truth ye are the poor. In the holy words, God is the all-possessing, shall even as the true morn break forth gloriously resplendent upon the horizon of the lover's heart and abide secure on the throne of wealth. So Sufis sometimes will, would refer to themselves as Sufis, but even more prevalent was were these words, the people, the companions, or the poor, al-qam, al-ashab, al-faqir. To try to define Sufism, we might start with its etymology. The word Sufi is related to the Arabic word tasawwuf. Trying to figure out what is the root etymology has generated much discussion among scholars. It has been posited that it is linked to the Greek word sophos, such as we hear in English with the word philosophy, or the love of wisdom, sophos meaning the wise. Uh, in the book Mystical Dimensions of Islam, which we'll be reading for this introduction to the Sufism course, Anne-Marie Schimmel says that this is an interesting but theologically impossible connection that the word Sufi has to do with sophos and etymological genealogy. Besides that the word sophos comes from an Indo-European language, while Tasawuf and Sufi are from the Arabic, a Semitic language, so different language families. I don't know the linguistic roots of such an argument that it's philologically impossible for these words to be connected, but for sure in a more conceptual approach, Sufism in a way has to do with a quest for wisdom. And Marie Schimmel also notes how poets have played with similar sounds of the word Sufi with that of the word pure, safi, and the word for purity, safa, saying that he that is purified by love is pure, or safi, and he who is purified by the beloved is a sufi. You can read that on N. Marie Schimmel's Mystical Dimensions of Islam, page 39, and that is their pages, they're listed on the PDF application itself, not on the scanned pages itself, so often at the bottom of a PDF or sometimes at the top, it lists the PDF applications designates the page rather than, say, the number on the physical page that was scanned. If you want to read more information and discussion of Schimmel talking about these roots, linguistic roots of the word Sufi. However, Schimmel is of the mind, along with most scholars who have researched the subject 
that the origins of the word Sufi are not completely clear, but it seems to come from the word Suf, which refers to a coarse wool garment, also called a karka, that the first generation of Muslim ascetics wore as a sign of their simplicity, modesty, and poverty. Later on, with later generations of Muslim ascetics and then Muslim Sufis per se, the coarse wool garment, which came in different colors, sometimes blue, sometimes white, sometimes other colors, each having some symbolic meanings, that later on these coarse wool garments became an initiatory uniform of someone who has entered with a Sufi order or brotherhood, studying the practices and discipline under a Sufi master, peer, or sheikh. To understand what is Sufism, it is useful to look at Sufi's own definitions of Sufism, and Shimma provides a good number of interesting ones. She says that the Sufi master Junaid, who was the undisputed leader of the Iraqian school of mystics and died in the year 910 CE, he wrote, Sufism is not achieved by much praying and fasting, but it is the security of the heart and the generosity of the soul. So even while there might be practices of deep devotional discipline, such as praying and fasting, the core heart of Sufism is expressed by Junaid as not being these practices of devotion itself, but this security or certitude and confidence of the heart, its peacefulness, as well as its and result in having an openness, a liberality, a generosity expressed in actions. Another interesting definition by someone who is a contemporary of Junaid, another Sufi master by the name of Ruwaim, he said, The Sufis are people who prefer God to everything, and God prefers them to everything else. And that whatever he sees, whatever the Sufi sees, whatever the Sufi sees, he sees it from God and knows that God's loving kindness embraces all creation. So this is a person who doesn't find value in anything but in its relationship to God and God's own loving kindness as demonstrated through the manifold facets of the creation itself, including one's own being. These are people that put God and their relationship to God as first and foremost priority over everything else. Another definition that Shimmel quotes is that Sufism is not composed of practices and sciences, or, or, or study and scholarship. It's not composed of practices and sciences, but it is morals. And who surpasses you in good moral qualities surpasses you in Sufism. So similar to Junaid's emphasis on security of the heart and generosity of the soul, it's not any particular practices, study, or scholarship that makes one a master practitioner of this path of mysticism, but it is the end result of morals and virtues that are cultivated in the heart and soul. And whoever has done this has mastered Sufism. I'm, I'm reminded as a Baha'i of al Baha's articulation that someone who truly practices the Baha'i faith and someone who truly practices Christianity are of the same quality, value, and character as, as the spirit, the morals of both religions express are one and the same. We can also refer to the great famous poet and Sufi Rumi when he was asked what is Sufism? He was said to have answered to find joy in the heart when grief comes. Perhaps this ability to meet grief and tribulations with joy is a sign of one's deep and deepening relationship with God. I'm reminded of Baha'u'llah's hidden word, the true lover yearneth for tribulation, even as doth the rebel for forgiveness and the sinful for mercy. Those who sought to define Sufism also referred to three, a threefold meaning, levels, or facets of the Sufi path. Those that are devoted to the Sharia, which are the actual physical practices and conduct such as prayer and fasting and doing that on a regular basis and dedicatedly. There is, is also the facet of tariqa, 
which refers to, in my understanding, those that have taken the strong step of the inner life of devotion and trying to cultivate a more intimate relationship with God. This is the inner life of devotion beyond just the physical movements that might help with this devotional path. And then there is the facet of hakika, which refers to truth and the encounter with truth. So this is one that through their devotional path has had direct experience of truth and abiding secure and certainty in the knowledge of truth. I'm reminded in the ideal of hakika of Abdul Baha's definition of faith as conscious knowledge expressed in action. Since Sufism has to do with mysticism, then we might ask ourselves, what is mysticism? First, we can take an aesthetic approach to the question of mysticism, having to do with feelings, emotions. So mysticism in this purview or per perspective is intense emotions such as love, joy, gratitude, peace. And these emotions are related to or put in relationship to the divine, the religious, the way, or the ultimate itself. So perhaps having these emotions without a conscious association with them, with things religious or holy, would perhaps leave them as not being characterized as mystical itself. The Gnostic approach, the one of intuitive inner knowledge, is one of awareness, consciousness, or knowledge of, of the one reality, sometimes characterized as wisdom, as light, as love, or perhaps what the Buddhists call sunyata, which is often defined as emptiness, nothingness, openness, or hermeneutic, a posture of openness that things can't truly be defined or characterized in an absolute sense. It must just be intuitively known, or that of the apophatic, the ineffable, can't be described, can't be explained, and being okay, being comfortable with the ineffability of reality itself. Schimmel notes that mysticism across religions often use three different images to designate what they're doing. One is the path of the wayfarer. This is the path of the traveler. She refers to Pilgrim's Progress. It's the path of the journey. Baha'is are familiar with the image of the seven valleys, the one journeying towards God passes through. Another is the alchemy of the soul. This is the transmutation or transformation of dross metals into gold. Here, used metaphorically, of the transformation of the soul in, in the words of Baha'u'llah from satanic strength into heavenly power or base ennoble qualities into virtues and spiritual attributes. Three, that of the lover and the beloved. That God is one's consummate beloved and say loving, intense, ardent, passionate relationship. And Sufi poets, for example, would use much in the language metaphors of human love, human love to make sense of the passionate love of the mystic wayfarer. Anne-Marie Schimmel articulates that there are basically two types of mystical experience that are expressed throughout all the world religions, including the mystical path of Islam, often called Sufism. One is the mysticism of infinity, which is often referred to as fana in Sufi writings, language which Baha'u'llah himself often takes up and is referred to repeatedly in the hidden words in the Arabic. 
this mysticism of infinity is seen as a complete union of the self and God, or as a drop returning to the ocean, the drop becoming lost in the ocean, and its reality only being a reality of, of as a drop in the ocean, it can be seen as a loss of self to the ultimate. There is no thing but God, and all things are as nothing but in their relationship or expression of the ultimate. This is the experience of being lost in God, that there is no more I am. The only I am that is left is that I am of the all-pervading reality of God. The second is what Shimma calls the mysticism of personality. And this uses the Arabic word baqa, which is fun to say. And Baha'u'llah, too, takes up such language in the Arabic hin hin words of baqa. And this is the relationship of one to another. This is the relationship of the creature to, the, to its creator. It is the relationship of the slave to the Lord, or the servant to the Lord. And the word slave, abd, in Arabic is often also translated as servant, both in Islamic as well as in Baha'i context, or that of the lover to the beloved. There's two, they have an ardent, passionate relationship, but there's two in the relationship. The self is not completely lost. The self has reality, but that reality is only significant always in its relationship to its creator, its Lord, its beloved. However, Shimmel makes notes that most mystics don't dichotomously just express one, the mysticism of infinity, or the mysticism of personality, but express both types, not purely one or the other. And many Sufi poets would go back and forth between one sort of metaphorical articulation of this of, of, of mysticism and the other metaphorical expression of mysticism. And Marishima also makes notes that mysticism and mystery, and these English words both from the come from the Greek mayin, which literally means to close the eyes. So there's something about mystery in mysticism. There's something about closing the eyes. How do we make sense of this idea of closing the eyes? To make sense of what this closing the eyes means, I offer my own understanding of the Arabic hidden word, O son of light, forget all save me and commune with my spirit. This is of the essence of my command. Therefore, turn unto it. This is the Arabic hidden word number 16. And like we one finds when reading the Quran in Arabic, there's a play with words and play with sounds, a repetition of sounds, repetition of, of root words as well in different forms, different formats, by which the reader or hearer is moved, impelled, or encouraged, I believe, to strive to make connections between the different facets of God's creations or relationship between various spiritual concepts to try to see, perceive, feel, and understand spiritual reality and its wholeness. So when we read the hidden words of Kalimat al maknuna in its Arabic, we read, Ya ibn al-Nur, this is the O Son of Light, Insa Duni, this is forget all save me. Wa anas biruhi, and commune with my spirit. We'll focus on on this for a type of interpretation that finds inter interesting connections between what it means to be human, perception, forgetfulness, remembrance, communion, and companionship. So my argument is basically. This observation, which I find interesting, that is that the the word for human, ness, insan, singular, ness, plural, human beings. The word for perception, the word for forget, insa. The word for communion, okay, or what's translated as communion, honest. This is related to the word companionship. And 
those who are familiar with Baha'i history and will remember Anis, who, or at least is the name given to a young man who begs to accompany the Bab to his execution. He becomes his companion in this martyrdom and perhaps in all the worlds of God. And so this companionship and communion having close close meaning and meaning as well. So the root letters of all these words, human, one of the words for perception, one of the words for to forget, for having communion, having companionship, these all share, well, depending on the dictionary, either the roots, I or A and S, or in other Arabic dic dictionaries, the words N, U, S. So in the Arabic it would be Aleph, Nun, Sin, or Nun, Wow, Sin. That there's something about being human in which we have the powers to decide what we're going to focus on perceiving, and what we're going to focus on closing our eyes to, or forgetting. So in this hidden word, Baha'u'llah commands his followers to close their eyes to or forget in Saduni, forget all save him. But open their eyes to, to perceive, to commune, have companionship with with his spirit, wa'anas bi ruhi. So insa, forget, all the world, all save him, anas bi ruhi, to have communion or companionship with his spirit. Interesting enough, this hidden word begins with the salutation or call of Ya ibn nur O son of light. Whereas one of the most popular salutations or calls is Ya ibn al-insan, which is, once again, from this root and is translated into English as O son of man. If you wanted to hear the the rest of this Arabic hidden word as it goes, Hadha min jawhari amri fa aqbil ilay. This is the essence of my command, therefore turn unto it. This word, jawhari, Baha'is will also know from the word, the uh, the title of the book in English, Gems of Divine Mystery, which is translated sometimes as gem and sometimes as essence. Now this is of course just my own exegesis or understanding of the interesting conceptual and etymological connections between these different words which share the same root. Should it be helpful to you? Great. If not, no, no worries. And it is not in any way express a view that I've found in exact backing for in any part of the Baha'i writings themselves. However, it is very interesting to look at what the authoritative interpreter of the Baha'i faith has said about mysticism and its place among Baha'is. One of my favorite quotes on this subject matter co comes from a letter written on behalf of the guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Effendi, to an individual believer, dated December 8th, 1935. And you can see this paragraph record in directives from the Guardian, a compilation. Shoghi Effendi record to have, to have said, the core of religious faith is that mystical feeling which unites man with God. This state of spiritual communion can be brought about and maintained by means of meditation and prayer. The Baha'i faith, like all other divine religions, is thus fundamentally mystic in character. Its chief goal is the development of the individual and society through the acquisition of spiritual virtues and powers. It is the soul of man which has first to be fed, and this spiritual nourishment prayer can best provide. Laws and institutions, as viewed by Baha'u'llah, can become really effective only when our spiritual, when our inner spiritual life has been perfected and transformed. Otherwise, religion will degenerate into a mere organization and become a dead thing. 
I find this these words very interesting that Shoga Fendi defines the core of religious faith to be that mystic feeling which unites man with God. And he in turn defines this mystical feeling as a state of spiritual communion, which meditation and prayer can in turn cultivate. And that the Baha'i faith shares with all divine religions this mystical characterization or this mystical impetus. So perhaps learning about Sufism, the mystical expressions of Islam, can help a Baha'i understand the mystical currents within all religions. And then we see words similar to how some of the Sufi masters understood the very spirit or razón de true, the very heart of what Sufism means. Its chief goal is the development of the individual and society, the acquisition of spiritual virtues and powers. So much more than any sort of practice of devotion itself, which can be of value, much more than having any sort of inner visions or mystical experiences themselves, which can be of value in themselves. The truer and fuller value is the acquisition of spiritual virtues and powers, which develops both the self and the society in turn. And Shoghi Fendi characterizes the building up of institutions and the practice of laws for the order of society as having at their very heart and spirit this development of the devotional life, the inner spiritual life of the human being must be perfected and transformed. Likewise, Anne-Marie Schimmel has defined mysticism as that great spiritual current which goes through all religions. So like Shoya Fenny said, like all other religions, is thus fundamentally mystic in character. So the study of mysticism in Islam or mysticism in Buddhism or in Hinduism or in Christianity or in Judaism or in Sikhism perhaps can help a person, Baha'i or not, understand mysticism in its general senses as well as in its particular senses within all the world religions. Another quote from the guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Effendi, related to the place of mysticism for Baha'is. The guardian feels so-and-so should study more deeply the teachings and meditate on what he studies. We liken God to the sun, which gives us all our life. So the spirit of God reaches us to the souls of the manifestations. We must learn to commune with their souls, and this is what the martyrs seem to have done, what brought them such ecstasy of joy that life became a nothing. This is the true mysticism and the secret inner meaning of life, which humanity has at present drifted so far from. The guardian will pray that this dear friend may deepen his understanding and arise, become a wonderful teacher of the faith. Mm. So in this lovely quote, which I tried to commit to memory about half my life ago, I liked it so much. Shoghi Effendi equates communion with the soul of the manifestation as communion with the spirit of God itself. And this communion, this state of spiritual communion as the true mysticism and even the secret inner meaning of life itself, the very purpose of life. And this inner communion bears fruit in becoming a wonderful teacher of the faith, perhaps both by the example of one's actions, as well as by the effect of one's words as well. This was written also on behalf of the Guardian. This one was written to the Manchester Spiritual Assembly. Manchester, I believe, is in England and dated 28 July 1950, and is found in the compilation of letters unfolding destiny. Perhaps the study of Sufism can help Baha'is and other curious people taking this course reflect on their own inner life and their place of prayer and meditation within it. Prayer and meditation has been central to so many of the world's religions in developing one's inner spiritual life, that state of spiritual communion. 
we'll learn further about the practice of Sufi vigils, often called chilas, which refers to the Persian word for 40. And in chilas, a Sufi is part of their initiation often, then routinely later, every so often, they'd be asked to remove themselves, go into seclusion. Often there, a Sufi lodge or order would have a special house where a room was designated for, for such a thing, and they would fast for these 40 days. Uh, I do, from what I understand, they would do it something like Islamic fast, where they would eat lightly before sunrise and sunset and, and drink lightly and fast during the remaining 12 to 16 hours of, of sunlight. Uh, but they would spend that time, that 40 days and nights, praying and meditating and trying to deepen their spiritual life constantly. Why, why 40? I'm not entirely sure, but perhaps it's related to the emphasis the number 40 gives, especially within the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, for example, we can see uh, the 40-year the exile of Moses after he kills a man in Egypt in his own exile to Midian uh, before he sees the burning bush and is commanded to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Uh, and then once the people have been let go, their 40 years of wandering in Sinai, their own for spiritual purging and purification to be become to ready themselves to occupy the Holy Land. Jesus' own 40 days of self-purification in the wilderness before he's really commissioned to begin his mission. There are some traditions that suggest that Muhammad himself would do 40-day retreats of meditation, prayer, especially be, before his the inauguration of his mission when he had the encounter with the angel Gabriel who said, Ikra, read in the name of the Lord, or recite, proclaim in the name of the Lord. And similarly, this experience happened to Muhammad when he was said to be of the age of 40. Now, Mul Hussein, should say Bushrui, is recorded in the dawn breakers to have prayed and fasted in Najaf for 40 days before he took his journey to try to find the promised one of Islam that Sid Qasim Rushdie said would be coming very soon. Perhaps Mullah Hussein Bashuri was influenced by the Chila practice itself of, this, of the Sufis to choose 40 days and to pray and fast before he begins his journey. Similar interesting practices of long and ardent devotion to try to develop one's spiritual life and an encounter and direct encounter experience of God is the Methodist Christian and Pentecostal Christian practice of tarrying. Tarrying meaning to, to stay or wait or linger. The Christian will long for and beseech and supplicate, praying for long periods of time, sometimes hours, often through the night, until the Holy Spirit arrives or they have this direct experience of the divine in their estimation. And the practice seems to be that God will perceive the sincerity and ardor of the seeker for this direct divine encounter and deepening of his or her relationship with God and will allow him or her to be blessed with the experience of the Holy Spirit. The Tibetan Buddhists practice with mantras, a similar sort of long, dedicated focus and concentration on what they see as spiritual reality. One of my favorite examples of this comes from the wonderful book by Professor Jan Willis called, called Dreaming Me, Black, Baptists, and Buddhists in which her own guru 
asks her about her practice of Dorje Sampa mantra in which she recites this mantra at least two hours a day and, and he's he's uh, quite surprised and sad that she uh, only does two hours a day of this mantra um, and encourages her to try to find more time and more recitation of this mantra on a daily basis and I uh, found online a translation of and and the word the words that are used of this mantra um, only the beginning opening say third of it that I cite here it says Om Benza Sato Samaya Manu Palaya Benza Sato Tenopa Tishta Dri Dome Bahawa Suto Kayo Me Bahawa and uh, roughly translated as O Diamond Mind Bodhisattva protect the Samaya or, or the Buddhist ethical vows and practices reveal yourself as a diamond mind may you remain firm in me grant me complete satisfaction grow within me and so this dedicated practice for a good chunk of one's day each day is seen in the Tibetan Buddhist or Vajrayana branch of Buddhism as a very helpful practice for the own their own spiritual development towards enlightenment of the sincere Buddhist. The Baha'is have some perhaps similar analogous practices. The the amount of attention, discipline of concentration and focus required to, to say the long obligatory prayer without getting oneself distracted through it. Uh, I've found very helpful for the uh, although I can't say that I've ever gotten completely through it without getting distracted at least a couple of times, um, been very helpful for my own spiritual practice or the, uh, the saying of the Lao Paz and, uh, perhaps something of similar or kin in a way, have some sort of relationship to the mantra practice of, of focusing on what Baha'is regard as the greatest name of God, kind of this super attribute of Abha, which encompasses all other attributes of God, the the all-glorious. And this recitation 95 times in a, at a certain portion or time period of one's day. Uh, the, the, um, we read that Shoghi Effendi took the time to translate and compile the prayers and meditation of Baha'u'llah, this volume, to help Baha'is deepen their own devotional life and drawing on this book as well as other compilations of prayers has been very helpful for Baha'is to develop their own spiritual life. We uh, um, Baha'is who fast from March 2nd to March 20th as they're doing their prayers before the fast starts and during the fast and during the close of the fast and especially in the English translations uh, by struggle to find short prayers that <laughs> can only take a few minutes to say during these times, especially sometimes when you're trying to get a prayer in last minute before you break your fast at 6 p.m. or whatever it is after 12 hours, and then try to find that short prayer that you find that oh, all the prayers are or good three, five, seven, sometimes nine pages in in um, in most prayer books and, and take a good while. To say, and perhaps, uh, although there are shorter prayers that Baha'is can now find, um, perhaps his practices to help the sort of focus and kind of tearing practice of to cultivate one's own spiritual life through through the through the fast itself, and then Baha'is have the and are trying to develop their own spiritual life for their communities. And open these to to friends, neighbors, and relatives by having devotional gatherings in which um, communally people can come together and commune with God and develop their own relationship with God through praying together and singing devotional prayers and and quotes from Baha'i writings together. I don't want to suggest through this discussion that Baha'is or other people need to pray for hours and hours 
each day to develop their own spiritual life, but perhaps finding what they can apportion each day, and if they can apportion a little more than they currently are, to, to find a good chunk of time to, to focus and in deepening and making more intimate the relationship with, with God um, might be helpful. I know I'm working to find more consistently a good chunk of time each day and each week to be able to do such things to help my own relationship. I found this quote from Dr. John Azelmont's famous introduction to the Baha'i faith called Baha'u'llah and the New Era. Very concise and helpful to understand perhaps what mysticism means in the Baha'i context and in many ways in the Sufi context as well. To be God's lover, that is the sole object of life for the Baha'i. To have God as his closest companion and most intimate friend, his peerless beloved, in whose presence is fullness of joy. To love God means to love everything and everybody, for all are of God. The real Baha'i will be the perfect lover, who will love everyone with a pure heart, fervently. He will hate no one. He will despise no one. For he will have learned to see the face of the beloved in every face, to find his traces everywhere. His love will know no limit of sect, nation, class, or race. I really appreciate this quote of this developing the intimacy of one's own relationship with God. This lover to the beloved relationship is, is one which one also hopes to deepen one's relationship with the natural world the creator world, and with each human being in it as well, looking for the face of the divine or the spark of the divine in, in each and every face, finding spiritual attributes in each and every person without limit of religion or sect or nationality, social class or race. Finally, while we have focus on mysticism as the heart of Sufism, or this seeking of individual spiritual advancement in one's relationship to God, we should make note that Sufism can designate a whole body of other aspects of, of Islam, including forms of forms and genres of theological and theosophical literature in which different Sufi masters tried to expound upon different facets of, of the development of one's spiritual relationship and what this relationship and end results actually mean and look like. There's also the literature of moral tales, and it's called Kisa and poetry share, in which through the vice of poetry as well as short little fables and stories, Teachers of the Sufi path have tried to communicate and inspire others to take a path in their lives. Sufism also refers to different orders, paths, fraternities, brotherhoods, sometimes called tariqas or, or uh, lodges in which different people that want to advance their spiritual path will come together around someone who they see as a spiritual master. And finally, there's tombs associated with holy men and women and down with Baraka. And these holy men are, and women are often connected with a Sufi order as having been Sufi masters or teachers. And after they die and buried, their tombs become associated with this thing called baraka, or spiritual blessing and spiritual power, spiritual charisma, in which the one who wants some sort of blessing in their life can pray at that tomb and believe that they will gain intervention by that holy man or woman buried there, that their prayer may be answered. So we can look at examples of Sufism as theology, Meaning, I define here a discourse in which the path of mystical realization is attempted to be explained in a direct way, as opposed to poetry and metaphors, stories, or parables. And we read in when the books will be reading some significant pieces of Giulio Savi's Toward the Summit of Reality. 
he records the same Junad of, of Iraq or Al Junad Baghdadi as saying Tawhid or recognition of the unity of God. Tawhid consists in existence without individuality before God, with no third person as intermediary between them. A figure over which his decrees pass as he in his omnipotence determines that he should be sunk in the flooding seas of his unity, completely obliterated both from himself, from God's call to him, his answer to God. It is a state where the devotee has achieved the true realization of the oneness of God in true proximity to him. He is lost to sense and action because God fulfills in him what he hath willed of him. The worship who maintains this unity loses his individuality. I think this should have said, the worshiper who maintains this unity loses his individuality. There's also Sufism as mystical poetic literature and stories. And in the in Europe and North America, English speaking world, the in the English speaking world, the most famous of these of, is of course Rumi among these poets. And I'll try to insert the link of this great website in which you can hear recite in Persian with an English translation alongside it. Uh, this poem of Rumi where he contemplates the messiness of being human and one's yearning for union with the one. I also uh, post this website in which one can hear a, the very poetic, rhythmic and rhyming Mahnavi of Rumi reciting its original Persian along with English translation so those of us without access to Persian can good sense of what it's talking about. Then there's this story or parable that's found in one of the books you might read at least ex excerpts from in this course, The Conference of the Birds by Atar. And the section designated in the translation is number 70. Atar tells this story of the grateful slave and it's a story I particularly liked it. It says, one day a good-natured king gave a rare and beautiful fruit to a slave who tasted it and thereupon said that never in his life had he eaten anything so delicious. This made the king wish to try it himself. He asked the slave for a piece, but when he put it into his mouth, he found it very bitter. He raised his eyebrows in astonishment. The slave said, Sire, since I have received so many gifts at your hand, how can I complain of one bitter fruit? Seeing that you shower benefits on me, why should one bitterness estrange me from you? So, servant of God, if you experience suffering in your striving, be persuaded that it can be a treasure for you. Another facet of Sufism are the various Islamic orders, paths, tariqas, schools, or lodges. And we'll be learning a little bit about these, although this Sufism course will not systematically introduce you to the various Sufi orders. But these Sufi orders are genealogies of, of Sufi masters. These masters are sometimes also called pairs, which means basically pillar. Pairs or sheikhs, teachers, or murshid, guides with disciples. So genealogies meaning one person appoints another who appoints another, and, and the latest Sufi master can trace back this lineage before him of being of being appointed by so and so who was appointed by so and so right so there's genealogies so there's these various genealogies of masters of the mystical path and people surround themselves with these um, surround themselves around the spiritual master who in turn mentor uh, the disciples and lead them in, on the path with different practices and attitudes and disposition dispositions of spiritual development. So I've named a few of the, some of the most famous ones, including the Mevlevi or the Maulawiya, which was founded by Rumi, um, after the word Maulana or master, and they're famous for the whirling der dervishes, and we'll be sure to provide some, some videos of the whirling dervishes as part of this Sufism course. The Bektashi, Bektashiya group, which was founded in 
was what is now Turkey in the 13th century by a mystic humanist and philosopher from Khorasan. There's the Qadiri or Qadiriya, which is the most widespread Sufi order found in Baghdad in the 11th century. The, the judge Sheikh Muhyiddin, for whom Baha'u'llah revealed the Seven Valleys, was a member of this order. So we're going to read in Julius Savi's um, book, Summit of Reality. Uh, there's the Naqshbandi, Naqshbandiya, which is the second most widespread Sufi order. It was founded in the 14th century in Bukhara, which is in present-day Uzbekistan. There's the Khalidiyya, uh, which is the, a branch of the Naqshbandiya itself, founded in 19th century in Kurdistan, so very recent. Baha'u'llah was a frequent guest of this order during his retirement into Sulaymaniyya, and the four valleys was revealed in answer to the question of the head of the order in Kurdistan. And Julio Savi makes note of this. There's also the Chisti uh, Sufi order that began the 10th century in Afghanistan, is now popular in Pakistan, and they're known for their well-frequented shrines of holy men and their use of Qawwali, which is devotional music, and we'll hear some examples of Qawwali in this Sufism course. Here's some anthropomorphic calligraphy of the Sufi path with verses often from the Quran or of poetry related to the mystical path. Finally, there are the tombs associated with holy men and women endowed with Baraka, so this spiritual power or blessing, this charisma. And these holy men and women who are linked with having been spiritual masters or greatly spiritually felt people within a Sufi order genealogy are seen as intercessors to answer prayers, prayers for healing, prayers um, to have children or to have, have a successful labor, to have prosperity in business, or just plain spiritual development itself. And one of these famous tombs connected with a master of the Chisti order is that of to the tomb of Salim Chisti, who died in 1572 which, if I remember correctly, is found in Pakistan. So finally, I recommend, based on this, these discussions and this introduction, to relook at your definition of Sufism that you, that you wrote down at the beginning of this lecture and revise, modify, expand, or deepen it based on new thoughts and understandings that may have took place during these discussions, as well as to revisit your definition of mysticism, uh, what new insights or understandings do you come up with through this discussion and, and perhaps modify your original definition as a, as a way to conclude um, as well as initiate your journey into this course on Sufism.